Hello and welcome. We're pleased to have you join us for today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by CPP, the exclusive publisher of several powerful assessments, including the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator and the CPI 260. My name is Laura Simons, Product Marketing Manager here at CPP, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. It will run for approximately one hour with the last 10 to 15 minutes reserved for your questions and Rob's answers. If you have a question, please submit it via the questions box located on the right side of your screen. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation and we will address as many as possible. This webinar is being recorded and afterwards we'll send out a link to the recording and a copy of the presentation slides today, as well as the recording and slides of the first refresher webinar on June 20th. This is the second in our two-part series of refresher webinars on the CPI 260 assessment. The first webinar focused on the client feedback report. For those of you who went through a certification workshop, today's webinar is a refresher of what you learned. For others, it's a review to brush up on facts about the assessment and interpretation techniques. Our speaker today is Robert Devine. Rob is a senior management consultant, author of the CPI 260 certification program and other books and the CPI 260 Certification Trainer. Rob, welcome, and I'd like to turn the presentation over to you. Thanks very much, Laura, and uh, hello, everyone. And I can say welcome back to some of you. As Laura indicated, there was a session back, I guess, last June when we went through the client feedback report as a refresher webinar. And during that presentation, we uh, met John Sample. Uh, we ran through John. Uh, he was a real client of mine, and we ran through his uh, client feedback report results. And at that time, we came up with a series of strengths and possible developmental opportunities for him based on his CPI 260 scale scores. So today, as Laura indicated, I want to continue that conversation about John, except I'd like to emphasize the coaching report for leaders, that second report for the CPI 260. That's the narrative report the one that doesn't show any scale scores or scale names. Um, but um, it uh, uses scale scores uh, behind the scenes to uh, come up with a narrative about strength, style, and developmental opportunities. So, so the slide that you're looking at uh, with this agenda kind of shows that. I'm going to start out with just a very, very brief overview of the client feedback report. Again, feel free at some point to go back and take a look at that other webinar on the client feedback report if you need to. And then I want to dive quickly into the coaching report for leaders, um, talk about that snapshot page and the worksheet, and then take a look at John's uh, coaching report for leaders and pull out some um, observations that are made in the coaching report and add them to what we started uh, last time we all spoke. So with that in mind, let's uh, move into the next slide. You'll be able to see, uh, this should be familiar to any of you that attended the the uh, certification programs, CPI 260, it's an empirically derived assessment. That second bullet's the big one for the whole screen. It, the CPI is descriptive, and it describes you as if you were being described by a group of people who know you real well and who are being objective. Um, the other big slide on this scale is uh, the, la the second to last slide and the one before that. That is, the CPI is, besides being descriptive, it's also comparative. It's one of those assessments in which we actively use norms to take a look at expected score ranges and then make proposals about a person's strengths and limitations based on their similarities and differences to those norm ranges. Uh, and uh, also, that uh, third from the bottom bullet that the CPI adds to what's known about you um, can't emphasize enough the need to add the CPI results to other information that you've collected for the client. So, so hopefully this is all uh, familiar stuff to you. On the next slide, you'll see um, from the client feedback report, the first place we start when we're looking at a 
that a person's results as, is at their CPI type. There are four of them. Uh, implementers, supporters, innovators, visualizers, they are defined by those two, what we think of as big picture or lifestyle scales. Uh, the first scale is that horizontal scale, which is basically an externality, internality scale, moving from left to right. Everyone falls on that continuum somewhere. Those who fall towards the left move towards people. Those who fall towards the right tend to pull back from people. It's a major theme on the CPI, as you know. The second major theme is represented by that vertical continuum. It is also an actual scale that contains a large number of items. And it tries to describe a person as being either rule favoring or rule questioning. Rule favoring folks tend to support the status quo and convention and the way we do things around here. Uh, rule questioners tend to say, well, why do we do it like that? Why are we, these rules are tripping us up. So it's a, it's a perspective, it's a worldview, and it's a major theme on the CPI 260. When we present the scales this way, one horizontal and one vertical, it gives rise to these four lifestyles. And you can see that for John, his style came out of implementer, which is a combination of moving towards people and being rule abiding. Notice that little diamond placed on the page that we're showing. It's fairly close to the innovator lifestyle, which is uh, moves towards people and is rule questioning. And that, that will play out a little bit when we take a look at some of John's uh, actual uh, scale results. Keep that one in mind. So we've got his type. We also need to take a look at his satisfaction level, which is on the next slide. As you may recall, the satisfaction scale is about the degree to which a person takes their lifestyle, whether it's innovator or implementer in John's case, or supporter or visualizer, the degree to which they, one takes their lifestyle to its positive potential. And the scale runs from one through seven. You can see that John's results came out as high as you can go so that we know that he, we're going to see a fairly pro-social expression of his type uh, versus uh, perhaps him showing the less refined and more edgy characteristics of the type, if you will. Um, so, um, so we've got a sense of John being an implementer, level 7. Remember that his scores came out as uh, close to that innovator line, so there might be some characteristics of both types that we ought to be on the watch out for. Uh, these are, uh, I think of these as contextual scales. They kind of are like wallpaper for me. They kind of give me some context against which I want to take a look at uh, uh, how this person operates. And speaking of how he operates, take a look at this next slide. This is uh, the, his lifestyle, uh, the implementer lifestyle, um, but translated into managerial style. And hopefully, again, attendees from the certification program will remember these slides. Um, you can kind of see we've got uh, some differences here for implementers and innovators. Remember, they both move towards people, but one follows the rules, one questions the rules. And you can see that their values are, are somewhat different. The implementers valuing accountability, clarity, big picture issues versus those innovators, oh, creativity and new ideas. And I like that, ways to beat the system. And uh, likewise, with support and what they want and what they display, you can see some of the differences. Take a look at that final panel, uh, how they make mistakes, typically. Think of these as derailers. When implementers derail, they tend to ignore creative or unusual ideas. Sometimes they can be too assertive, too aggressive, maybe. They can overlook interpersonal niceties. They can push too hard. And they can be competitive, overly competitive, and maybe competitive with the wrong people, competitive with people on their own team, versus those innovators. Look at how they tend to make mistakes, tending to uh, gloss over details or to neglect to monitor and demand accountability. So uh, whenever I see a set of results that are fairly close to the line like this, sometimes, what, like John, what I like to do is to print out um, information like these two, walk through it with my client, and ask him to tell me which ones does he think or she think are most appropriate and when do they occur. Remember, I want to develop a profile for, of strength and style, and this is a great way to start that conversation by working with your client to have them help you understand how they live their lives. So we start with that type and the level, 
again, we said that um, he came out as implementer level 7, so likely we'll see many of those characteristics. Apply some norms. Take a look at the next slide. As you may remember these, this is a series of about, oh, about 6,500 people in organizational settings. Uh, they've been collected at CPP through the website um, over a, a period, I think, of about two years when they collected this data. Uh, what's interesting about this is keep in mind that if you can see uh, the 50, the horizontal line for 50, uh, running about two-thirds the way down that uh, line graph, that 50 line represents the average score of 6,000 people from the general population. So you expect people to have a dominant score, which is that DO, that first scale showing at the bottom there as it's labeled, a dominant score of 50. And then in organizational settings, you can kind of see, oh, interesting. Most people score from about, oh, it looks like about what, 57, 58, up to about 65. And what's interesting is you can see that depending on what the organizational level is, the higher the scores, the average scores, and you can kind of see that. Uh, Non-supervisory employees generally start out with a dominant score of about 57.6, say around 57, and top executives usually come in at around 65 or so. Higher in the organization, the higher the dominant score. So a very interesting set of data here. Take a look at the very last scale, sensitivity. Notice that the higher one goes in the organization, the lower their sensitivity score. It tends to bottom out at around, we hope, in the low 40s. And, uh, and uh, run up to about 46, 47. So having this, remember, the CPI is descriptive as well as comparative. I take this data and then go to John's report. And this is what we did in the last uh, webinar. On the next page, you'll see page 6 from John's client feedback report. There are his actual scores for dominance, DO, capacity for status, CS, and so on. These are seven interpersonal scales, the dealing with others scales. And as you look through those results, you can kind of um, see, well, the score of 50, as we said, represents the average score of 6,000 people in the general population. And you can see that John's scores um, generally exceed that, with the exception of one scale. One of them is pretty close, empathy at 51, sociability at 44. So he, he's uh, he will show less sociability than people in general. And then when we take John's scores uh, and, and view them in relation to those norms, what I like to do is to mark the norms right on the report for John. And that's what's showing on the next slide. There you can see those little red hash marks are the ranges from those norms that I showed you a couple of slides ago. These, are, again, go from non-supervisory employees up to top executives. And I think that when you take a look at John's scores in relation to these uh, expected ranges, uh, a story starts to emerge. Now you can see that, gee, his dominant score is a little bit lower than we were expecting for people in organizational settings. It's certainly lower than uh, some of those more senior executives. We were expecting about 64, 65 for him. And you'll frequently see the scores up to about 70. And he's running a little bit cooler than that <laughs> at a score of about 53. A big one that jumps out is the third scale, the sociability scale. Again, you can see those expected ranges. We were expecting his scores to fall in around that 53, 55 or so. And uh, here he is coming out at uh, about 11 points lower in the direction of not being sociable, being quiet. Uh, not using uh, just general um, conversation to build relationships, um, rather kind of pulls back from people a little bit. And again, you see it in that final scale, the empathy scale. Again, we were expecting scores in the low 60s. What we generally see, here he is running at nine points behind or lower than people in, uh, in organizational settings. Probably not as attuned or alert to people and their emotions, uh, even their nonverbal messages. He misses things in his interpersonal relations. So 
we took these uh, this method of taking those hash marks. We went in in the previous webinar and we applied it to all of the scales for John's report. And here's what we came up with. On the next slide, you'll see the beginnings of some prose strengths. We came up with four strengths altogether, four areas of strength for John. The first area was in working with people. And you can see that what we said was uh, that uh, he can engage other people when required. Some of those scale scores on the previous um, slide kind of showed that. But that uh, um, he can be spontaneous sometimes. But more often than not, he's low key and deliberate, cautious in how he relates. Remember that that uh, sociability score was about 11 points lower. Um, as soon as I see this, I start thinking, gee, you know, some of the possible derailers um, uh, for John might be that he might be just a little bit too quiet with some people, or maybe some people need a little bit more rah-rah and cheerleading, and they might think that he doesn't share information or sell his ideas very well. Uh, you can kind of see that he uh, keeps some distance between himself and others. Again, uh, all of this um, stemming from his uh, interpersonal scores on the CPI, comparing them to what we were expecting. So on the next slide, we go from working with people uh, to uh, working with projects. And here again, you can kind of see that our uh, um, what we were looking at is the responsibility, the social conformance, and self-control scores. They were telltale scores. They were lower than we were expecting um, for, uh, for John. Uh, especially his uh, commonality scores were lower. That is, he uh, kind of moved to the beat of his own drummer as the uh, as the, uh, as the slide says. We also looked at his achievement scales and noticed that there's a big difference in his achievement scales in that his uh, achievement via conformance scales were about 11 points lower, and his achievement via independence scales were slightly higher. And so that's where we got these points about not liking to be micromanaged. And, um, and again, we pulled this from looking at his scale scores and at all of the supportive information um, about uh, conducting CPI interpretations that we uh, that we have. Uh, then on the next slide, you'll see a third strength, uh, perspective on leading. He will take on leadership responsibility, but again, you can see our comments are a little bit lukewarm, a little bit conditional, the way we word it with those leadership responsibilities. Again, we noticed that his highest scale score across the whole profile was achievement via independence. Um, that is, uh, that he likes to know what the goal is and then for people to back off and let him do it his way. And so you can kind of see the flavor of that um, noted in the, uh, in the bullets that we listed for uh, his approach to leading. Remember, too, that he was also close to that innovator line uh, from um, moving from an implementer over to an innovator and hence that notion of uh, being individualistic. Uh, but again, he can take on leadership responsibilities when he needs to, but uh, he does it in his way. Um, again, in that previous, um, in that previous webinar, we, we listed uh, a, a number of strengths for John. We gave you some detail as to how we got at these things. In fact, you'll even see these slides in that previous webinar. Let's go on to the next slide for the openness to change. Again, I um, wanted to remind you that his uh, flexibility scores were strong relative to his other scale scores. Uh, and his achievement by independence was quite high. It was the highest score across the whole profile. Uh, the interpretive information for the CPI tells us about uh, him being uh, able to work in structured situations, but really wanting personal freedom. He wants to do stuff his way. Uh, and, uh, he, uh, he can, and he's flexible and adaptable, as we, as we indicated. So we, got, we came up with those four strengths for John uh, about his interpersonal style, about the way he leads, his openness to change, and so on. And then we came up with the following slide, which was his first developmental opportunity. And again, it was all around that notion of his empathy scores being low, uh, uh, about his uh, sociability scores being low, uh, about some of the other scale scores that he had that I, I, I didn't get into but did in the last presentation, uh, just to come up with these points can appear aloof and distant. He needs to be basically more of a student of people, is what we would say when we take a look at his scale scores. He misses things about people and doesn't really take the time. Maybe he thinks he's 
meddling, <laughs> but he doesn't take the time to understand what motivates them, what drives them, and as we say here, what makes them tick. We think that if he were to attend to this as a possible developmental opportunity, it might make him even more effective in building uh, spirit and rapport with his coworkers and with his uh, associates and people that work for him and his colleagues. And uh, he might be able to be even more effective at selling his ideas and, uh, and get, getting people to help him. So that was one major cluster of uh, likely strengths that we came up with from his CPI results. Here's the second one. Uh, again, in some ways, there's a little, bit, um, a little bit of overlap, I suppose. I was very worried when I saw his scale scores for dominance, and I noticed that they were three, four points lower than the low end of the range. And uh, so that's why I um, um, indicated this, uh, these points here. It needs to uh, increase his vigor and the volume of his involvement. Uh, and I'm kind of worried that uh, he, uh, uh, he, he likely doesn't uh, use the interpersonal form to really adequately uh, sow the seeds and sell his ideas, get people comfortable with him and his initiatives. And, and that uh, likely, uh, and, and I'm kind of extrapolating from this data, that he might struggle a little bit with uh, uh, dealing with conflict, probably doesn't like conflict. He likes it when everybody takes responsibility for their own performance. He doesn't want to have to uh, confront and uh, demand accountability and so on when he's in a supervisory role. So, so these were the two uh, main uh, developmental opportunities that we had for John. And now what I'd like to do is to move on to the coaching report. So there's his cover sheet. We removed his last name there. And uh, uh, any of you that attended our session will know that the first thing you do when you get a coaching report for leaders is to go to page 14. And that's what I want to show you next. So here's John's page 14. And you can see that I've highlighted the column at the left. You can see uh, five core performance areas of self-management, organizational capabilities, team building, problem solving, sustaining the vision. And there are 18 leadership characteristics layered underneath. They're clustered into those five uh, areas. And uh, we think that these are uh, leadership characteristics that are well known. They're kind of universal. They are important. And uh, we and they are also uh, leadership characteristics that we think the CPI has a lot to say about. And uh, so um, on the next slide, you'll see I'm highlighting now uh, for John's 18 leadership characteristics that the report, the coaching report for leaders, pulled out six clear strengths. You can see them, self-control, responsibility, accountability, capacity for collaboration, and so on, all the way down to comfort with some comfort with visibility. So comparing John's results to a large sample of other on-track managers and executives yielded these six likely strengths. On the next column, and uh, the next slide kind of shows the magnifying glass icon highlighted that the CPI proposes these nine developmental opportunities, starting with self-awareness and resilience and use of power and authority and so on, running all the way down to influence. And, and uh, generally, um, what the CPI report is trying to say here is that there were some differences between John's scale scores and other on-track managers, and that these differences were likely in unfavorable directions. And, uh, and the unfavorable directions are um, are labeled with those names of self-awareness and resilience and use of power and authority and so on. There is a fourth column, and in the next slide you'll see I've got it highlighted now, the so-called arrows column. And uh, this one uh, is where we'd say that, uh, you know, one of the scales was likely, uh, one of his CPI scales was likely on track, and one of the, his CPI scales was likely not. And uh, we came, we said, gee, there's a difference between your um, scale scores and other on-track managers, but in these instances, we're not sure if this is important or trivial, because we don't know it, what you do for a living. Sometimes some characteristics are important in some settings, and they're not so important in others. But we wanted to alert you to the fact that there are some differences, and in effect, you need to decide, in this case, whether these three leadership characteristics could be developmental opportunities or, or maybe not things you need to worry about. So this is the first place that we go. This is page 14. This is a snapshot. It's the whole report at a glance. 
And then the next slide is the kind of the cheat sheet. It tells you um, which CPI scales the report logic was looking at in order to place those little squares under a strength, a developmental opportunity, or a you decide. So uh, this sheet is very similar to page 14. The difference is it shows the core performance area, the leadership characteristic, and it reveals the two CPI scales that we use to uh, try to uh, uh, drive the narrative in the report. So you can see in the first instance, the self-awareness uh, self leadership characteristic, there were two CPI scales that we looked at, self-acceptance and empathy. Hopefully you can see on the screen that the average score for 5,600 managers is shown by the little blue dot on that black horizontal line. That was the, so there's the mean score. In other words, 5,600 managers got an average score of self-acceptance, uh, of 58 on self-acceptance, sorry. And they got an average score of 60 on the empathy scale. We think that self-acceptance and empathy can shine a light on how self-aware is John. So what we did was say, well, let's take a look at these on-track managers uh, that attended these leadership development programs that we knew about, that had taken the CPI 260. Uh, we had their average scores for the two relevant scales. And then basically what we did was we drew a box around that average score that represents about half the sample. About 51% actually of the uh, sample is represented by that black horizontal bar graph. And basically what we did uh, was say, if your client scores are, if both of them are on those black horizontal bar graphs, that is, their scale scores came out more or less similar to a pretty large sample, 2,800 other uh, managers and executives, that uh, if your both scale scores show on those black horizontal bar graphs, we're going to call this a strength in the report. And frequently, if your scale scores are even higher, it gets called a strength. If both of those scale scores are lower than the black horizontal bar graph, it's going to call it a developmental opportunity. In other words, if, uh, if John's self-acceptance scores were 50 and his empathy scores were 50, this report's going to say, self, this guy is not as self-aware as other managers and executives because those two scale scores are lagging. So you kind of see uh, how the uh, logic of the report works. It's pretty simple, basic logic. Basically, it, try, it just compares your scores to these on-track managers and tries to say, similar? Well, they're on track, and you're similar to them, so this is likely an area of strength for you. But here's an area where you differ from them in an unfavorable way, and this is likely a developmental opportunity for you. So on the next slide, you can kind of see, you kind of starting to get the sense of the differences between the two reports. The client feedback report, the one that we spoke about last June, uh, it, we think of it as a profile report. It's got all the scale scores, and it's got all that precision and, and uh, scale names and so on. You remember the general population, there were 6,000 people. Their average scores were 50. And then we went in and we layered in ourselves by hand those, uh, those norms for organizational settings. Here in the coaching report, it's a narrative report. We were asked by a large number of customers to not show any scale scores or scale names because they didn't want to frighten off the clients with these what appear to be uh, sort of psychological sounding uh, uh, issues. So they wanted a narrative report with no uh, scale scores and scale names. And then what happens is the logic of the coaching report for leaders, as I mentioned, compares your client scores to 5,600 managers. They're on track managers. These were the high performers that organizations uh, identified and sent to leadership development programs that we uh, were tracking. And the coaching report for leaders, as I said, is a narrative, and it's got that coach's voice, and it provokes discussion. That's really what it's for, is to try to provoke discussion. Really, that's, the, that's our whole purpose, right, is to have a conversation with our client about strength and style and things that they could work on. And, and, the, and the CPI brings a host of that kind of information to the conversation. It turns the conversation from being a kind of intuitive, spontaneous thing to a factually based one. So on to the next slide, you'll see here's the, uh, a worksheet, again, uh, showing you this time. What I did was I pulled out John's six strengths 
as identified by uh, the logic of the Cochin Report for Leaders. Hopefully you remember this from his page 14. The first strength that John had was self-control. And you can see that uh, in order to kind of comment on whether or not John does show self-control, we looked at the self-control score for John. You can see that the average score looks like it's about 54 or so. And John's scores came in at 52. I plotted it right on there. The second scale we look at about self-control is social conformity, and kind of self-checking oneself relative to, to quote-unquote the rules. You can see the range of scores. Again, John's scale scores, both of them, fall right on that black horizontal bar graph. The score is 51. He just inched onto that black horizontal bar graph for social conformity. But he did make it, and so the logic of the report says, yep, this area of self-control is probably a it's probably a strength for John, and that he shows appropriate emotions. That thing that I wrote off to the left, basically what I did was I went into the text in the report and tried to summarize in just a couple of words what Sam Manoogian had said in three or four bullets about these particular uh, scale scores. So I moved on down and said, OK, what's the second strength that he had? Well, responsibility and accountability. Well, why is that a strength? Well, two scales, responsibility and leadership. You can see John's scores off to the right, 51 and 57. I pulled those scores from the client feedback report. They are both on the black horizontal bar graph. Therefore, it's identified as a strength. The text in the report is on page 7. I just wrote it on there so that I knew where to look when I'm talking to John. And the gist of the bullets that Sam Manoogian put in for those scale scores says that John pretty readily accepts responsibility and does what he says he'll do. That's kind of what it says. So I wrote that on there just to remind me of what to point out to John as we run through his report. Third area of strength, capacity for collaboration. Two scales, tolerance, creative temperament. You can see his scale scores. He's on the black horizontal line. And, and so it goes. So I ran through and took a look at his key strengths and uh, noted them off to the left and thought, gee, you know, we, uh, we started to uh, build some strengths for him when we were looking at our client feedback report there last June. What new things does the coaching report for leaders add to the narrative for me? And you can kind of see, I saw some, I thought, oh, that's interesting. I like that notion of being open to input and uh, offering uh, and supporting innovation and, and comfortable with new approaches and so on for managing change and that he's got some executive poise. I shouldn't forget that. I was very quick to jump on him for those lower uh, sociability scores. But he, uh, he does so, show some uh, executive poise and a little bit of, of, of appropriate ambition, too. He wants, to, he wants to show what he can do. And I shouldn't forget that, is what the report's saying. So these are his strengths. If you take a look on the next slide, you'll see he's, these are his developmental opportunities. It uh, looks like there's a lot written on there. He had nine um, developmental opportunities. Let's take a look at that first one, the self-awareness. We talked about it a little bit earlier. You can kind of see two scales, SA and EM, self-acceptance and empathy. Ah, that's why it was called a developmental opportunity. Look, his empathy score was 51. And the expected range was about 54 to about 67, would you say? So it was lower on empathy. So the report says, whoops, this is likely. He's probably not as self-aware. And the text in the report says that he's generally self-accepting because of that SA score, but perhaps a little less responsive to others. So I noted, remember we noted that from the client feedback report in our analysis of those scale scores, and here it's being confirmed. Then we go on to the, uh, to the second uh, developmental opportunity for him uh, was resilience. You can see the reason for that showing up as a developmental opportunity is that one of the scales, the well-being scale, missed by, gee, just about two, two points, like being on that black horizontal bar graph, and it gets pulled out as, uh, as a possible developmental opportunity. Uh, and the text in the report says something like, you know, there may be some issues in your life that might be draining your energy at this time. Could that be true? And so you can see the, the, um, the exercise that I go through. Here's something, uh, and we talked about this in the certification program. What I like to do is if I have to present the CPI in group settings, 
I like to distribute a blank sheet like this to the participants, give them their client feedback report, and have them go through and plot this information. Um, that would uh, uh, be a great exercise for them in order to get in, to get their hands in their own data and start to look for trends as to how are they similar and how are they different. And are some of the differences, are they important or are they trivial? And do the differences all cluster in one area? For example, are they all in the team building and teamwork area? Hmm, that's interesting. What's that trying to say to us? And so on. But again, you can see as I run through these uh, nine developmental areas, you can see that, um, well, usually because one or both of the scales is lower than the black horizontal bar graphs, those expected norm ranges, usually where I start when I've got nine like this is I take a look at those uh, leadership characteristics in which both of the scale scores missed the black horizontal bar graph, and also the ones that missed by the most. And you can see that uh, one of them uh, is in the area of understanding others. It's about midway down your slide. It's number nine. The two scales are empathy and insightfulness. You can see John's scores were 51 and 52. He missed both. And the report suggests that likely John is more task than people oriented. If you move down to number 13, handling sensitive problems, scores are empathy, it's used again, and dominance. And again, he missed both. When it comes to handling sensitive personnel issues, he probably doesn't. He probably hopes that they will mend themselves <laughs> or that people will somehow address them, but he doesn't like to he doesn't like to dig into that. And that can be a limitation for somebody who's in a supervisory role. Uh, the other thing to notice, by the way, on this sheet, you can see I've circled in the very center column, I circled the word dominance four times. We use the dominance scale four times. And of course, because uh, John's scale score was 53, and he just missed that black horizontal bar graph, it calls out four separate developmental opportunities for him. It says in terms of use of power and authority, number four, that first one, that he's less assertive. And is he really seeking to have authority? When it comes to being decisive, number seven, again, because he missed with dominance, the report text indicates that he's likely less decisive than others. When it comes to handling sensitive problems, number 13, again, the dominance score tripped him up there, as we just discussed. That he's less willing to confront issues and then number 17, influence. Again, the dominant score was low. So was sociability low. And, and it, the text in the report says that he is likely less persuasive. And then an idea that jumped out at me was, well, gee, how does this guy exert his authority? Hmm. He's likely a subject matter expert. That's probably how he got into this role, to uh, you know, have this uh, seniority over others. Because he knows, and I do happen to know, as I found out later on, in working with him, that he uh, he is a subject matter expert. He was acquired along with a product uh, that he knew a lot about, and that's he used that expert knowledge to exert authority more so than uh, any kind of social uh, wherewithal. So I picked that up from uh, working with him. But anyway, you can see how I took his uh, coaching report for leaders and uh, used the worksheet to understand how the report says what it says. On the next sheet, you can see, um, on the next slide, pardon me, I took his three you decide areas. You can see that the reason that it showed up under the arrows was that one of the, in each of the three instances, one of his scale scores was lower than the black horizontal bar graph. If both had been lower, it would have showed up as clear developmental opportunity. And you can see, uh, but in this instance, we felt, well, we weren't we weren't sure if it's always a developmental opportunity, again, because we don't know what it is that John does for a living. Uh, and so you can see that first one, he got arrows for comfort with organizational structure because his achievement by a conformance score was low. It was, uh, well, it got cut off there. The scores got cut off. But uh, he looks like he was about 44 in his, uh, uh, on his uh, AC score. The text in the report says that he prefers loose structure. He can be a change agent. And uh, going on to sociability and amicability, again, the sociability score is low. Probably works best alone or likes to work in small teams. Ooh, I like that comment. I'm going to use it in my report, I thought, when I thought. And likewise, with action orientation, his sensitivity scores were quite low. He was 
coming in at around 32, I think. Uh, and uh, it shows strong action, but he ignores criticism and uh, he ignores other people's feelings and can be impatient, is what the report suggests. So all of that to say, on the next slide, you'll kind of see, uh, I keep referring to going back into the uh, coaching report for leaders to pull out some text. You can see this is the text for the interpersonal skill and for the understanding others. That interpersonal skill, again, um, it, was, it fell under the arrows icon. Uh, and you can see the comments there. Um, others probably find him friendly and approachable, but unlike most other executives, may not proactively engage social interaction with others. Remember, this one had the uh, sociability scores were factoring in and the amicability scores, both of which were, were kind of low. Same thing with the understanding others. Uh, you can see that uh, what the text says, he may be less likely than other executives and managers to be described as compassionate, considerate, and caring. Again, it was that empathy and the sensitivity score is being low. That's what's running behind the scenes. Um, and that it goes on to kind of say others likely find him more task-oriented than people-oriented. I thought, oh, that's good. I like that. I'm going to use that in my report. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the next slide. You can see that working with people, again, so the text that's in black showing on your screen was the original set of comments that I made from the client feedback report. And then in looking at the coaching report for leaders, I uh, went through the comments as they were drawn out of the report and added and enhanced and clarified what I had started from the client feedback report um, comments that I made. So you can kind of see um, uh, the I added that notion, that notion of working best alone with small groups of people who he knows well and then he needs to guard against being perceived of as aloof and of keeping information to himself. He, uh, when I kind of suggest that to him, says, no, I don't really think that's an issue for me. I think that if it's important, I will table it. And uh, so basically what we did was we, we worked towards modifying these statements when we worked together, uh, where we said uh, at times that this can come up and that he needs to ask to make sure that people uh, understand his, his thinking and his ideas. If you take a look at the next slide, and working with projects, uh, we pretty well stayed with what we had. I just like this wording that I got from the coaching report for leaders about wanting to find his own path for getting results. But it kind of blends in with the other stuff that we had collected about marching to his own drummer. And uh, he uh, was one of those classic managers who says, you know, I hate it when people micromanage me. Therefore, I'll offer the same courtesy to my people. I won't micromanage them. The problem is, in a supervisory role, sometimes some situations and some people need a little bit of micromanagement. <laughs> they need to be shown how, and they need to uh, be shown how to take a complex project and break it into its pieces uh, in order to uh, be successful. Uh, others don't need that kind of help. But what we tried to do for John was to identify um, tactics that he could use to, to vary his style for how he delegated to others depending on their on their abilities and on their experience and commitment. Uh, then uh, for the next uh, slide, you'll see uh, uh, the perspectives on leading. We started out saying, yeah, well, he can take on leadership responsibility, but he's independent-minded and individualistic, and uh, he will get behind the objectives, but in his own way. And this is where we added in uh, the other comments about his leadership style from the coaching report that he'll likely use subject matter expertise to exert authority, and he did uh, agree with that when we when we presented it to him, and uh, that he tends to use that more so than that social persuasion, and that doesn't like it when he has to be forceful and direct. He's very uncomfortable with that. He prefers that staff self-manage, and so that comment that came from the coaching report for leaders about uh, not being that adept at handling sensitive problems very much rang true for him. On the next slide, we can kind of see the openness to change strengths. And again, uh, the coaching report for leaders enhanced what we've said from the client feedback report. As one of the real strengths, this guy is he's reasonably creative. At least he appreciates creativity, even if he doesn't come up with it. And uh, so he does remain open to new ideas and, and new ways. He's, he's willing to experiment, in other words. And we thought that was a good thing. So we wanted to list it in his strengths. For his developmentals, you can see 
see on the next uh, slide, here's his first developmental opportunity. Uh, we, again, we added from the coaching report that notion of being more task than people focused, that he, that rang true for him, uh, and that uh, he needs to explain his thinking. He needs to, to remember the sociability scores and the empathy scores were lower. And we said, you know, it's all right for you to slow down and explain your thinking. Even though you think they, they're going to come to the same conclusion you are, we think it would help if you don't assume that, and that you're more willing to explain your thinking. You need to open up a little bit more. And that really uh, resonated with him. And then the second uh, comment that we had for his uh, developmental opportunities on the next slide, uh, you'll see it um, uh, be, uh, again, re remember, it's somewhat associated with the first one. Uh, we wanted that dominant score was low, and we were worried that he uh, and his sociability scores were low, and his insightfulness scores were low, and that uh, we just added this notion of uh, getting his voice heard, especially with some of those more uh, loud and assertive uh, implementers that he uh, that we knew that he had to work with, uh, that he didn't want to he didn't want to uh, appear too silent. So that's what we uh, got from the coaching report for leaders. Uh, let's go on now to the uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, we got a few of them, quite a few in actually, and um, I, I'd like to respond to some of them. And I think perhaps there are some that will come in uh, during the uh, that came in perhaps during our our, our talk today. Um, first question: My client has all strengths, is indicated by the coaching report for leaders. How do we handle this? And the, uh, the, the great answer is, uh, is in the guide, the advanced guide for interpretation that Sam Manoogian wrote. If you take a look at page 67, this is the one that you may remember from the certification program. It has a mustard yellow cover. And on page 67, Sam Manoogian makes these points of what to do about clients that have got mostly strengths. First of all, um, they may doubt the validity of the report because they say, hey, wait a second, what, how did I ace this thing? Uh, clearly, I think that <laughs> I've got things that I need to work on. So Sam says, yeah, well, at the same time, even though all 18 or close to 18 leadership characteristics came out as strengths, scan through the text because sometimes what we did is we added action steps and things that they ought to take a look at. Um, even for characteristics that were identified as strengths, usually what they were were instances in which the scale scores, those one or both of those two scales that drive the narrative in the coaching report for leaders, was higher than that black horizontal bar graph. And so we would say, if, for example, if someone's dominant scores were high, that we'd say, well, you know, you're pretty decisive, but boy, you ought to make sure that you don't come across as uh, heavy-handed. Uh, so ask some of your people if that could be the case, and so on. Um, uh, also. Uh, the other technique that Sam mentions is to take a look at the client feedback report and look for differences relative to the appropriate norms, those norms that, you, uh, that we layered in right on the report. Look to see if there are any scales. Which ones are the biggest differences from the expected norms, either lower or higher? And uh, they'd likely be higher uh, with uh, clients with mostly strengths. And then the third uh, point that, uh, or fourth point that, that Sam makes in that text in his book about his report, The Coaching Report for Leaders, is to take a look at other information that you've got. Uh, sometimes you'll have uh, information from um, a, a, perhaps a Myers-Briggs, or maybe if it's a developmental situation, or maybe you'll have uh, performance reviews, or maybe you've got some sort of a work stimulation, or a role play, or who knows what else you're using in your battery of things. Uh, maybe a strong interest inventory that you're using, who knows. Uh, maybe some 360 results. And if you've got that data, again, don't forget to blend it in here um, with clients that come up on their CPI with mostly strength. So anyway, take a look at page 67. Sam elaborates on all of these ideas. Uh, going back to the questions again on the next slide, uh, my client has no strengths. Happens about 4 to 6% of the time where you'll get a client that has very few strengths. How do we handle this? Well, again, the answer is in the same place. It's in Sam Manoogian's mustard-colored advanced guide for the coaching report for leaders. It's on page 69 this time, and he elaborates on these ideas. Um, the, the second bullet there, well, first and foremost, what he says in the first bullet is that usually 
Uh, sometimes as a, uh, as, a, as a consultant, you wince when you see those kinds of results. And you go, oh boy, how am I going to present this? And when you get into the conversation with the client, they'll usually acknowledge, yeah, you know, I got some stuff uh, that challenges me at work. And they're often not surprised by the, uh, the lower scores and, the, uh, and, and that page 14 that shows lots of things to work on. Um, Sam suggests that one of the things you can do to kind of help them understand this is, is that look on that worksheet for the repeated use scales. Remember, we had dominance used four times. Independence is used two or three times. Self-control certainly is used three times. And just from two or three scale results, that could just be from one point or two points off that black horizontal bar graph, you could end up with uh, quite a slew of, uh, of, of uh, developmental opportunities. And I think it helps the client to explain that to them, that the report basically is just kind of say, hey, there are some differences here. What do you think? Do you think this could be something you should work on? Um, uh, again, uh, use the, the client feedback report, as Sam suggests in the third bullet, to take a look at the largest differences relative to the executive norms. I use that, I do that quite frequently. I look for the big differences, and I try to find just two developmentals, maybe three, but that's a stretch. I try to find just one or two developmental things that my client could work on uh, that would uh, bring them, bring them him or her the biggest uh, return on their investment of time and energy. Uh, and uh, again, uh, just going through those, uh, those uh, developmental opportunities as they're listed is to work with the client to help prioritize. And again, just pick two or three things. So it's in that final bullet. Uh, OK, let's go to the next slide and look for more questions. Uh, does the CPI 260 show anything specifically related to emotional intelligence? And OK, so what we did was say, well, if you take a look uh, in the literature, there are various models of social in or emotional intelligence that are out there. Uh, there are some that seem to be a little bit more, um, oh, what's the word, a little bit more uh, academic and scholarly uh, based. Others are a little bit more workmanlike. I picked the most popular one, which is that uh, Goldman notion that came out in 1998. I think he's got a couple of books out now one about emotional intelligence and another one about emotional intelligence in the workplace. And in his books, he identifies those five areas for self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, social skill, and curiously, to some of the critics of Goldman, uh, motivation, how that got in there. And uh, he, uh, so he identifies those five areas of, um, or themes in emotional intelligence. And what we did simply was go through the CPI scales and full CPI scales that conceptually match those concepts. So for self-awareness, again, we looked at self-acceptance and empathy, as it's done actually in the coaching report for leaders. That was that first uh, leadership characteristic we looked at. And also, we thought that the a sensitivity scale could shine a light. Remember, highly sensitive folks tend to be a little bit perhaps more self-aware than the real low scores on SM. And the V1 scale refers to that as a vector one scale. It's that uh, horizontal continuum that we talked about in the uh, certification program of moving towards people versus pulling back from people. We thought that the, the, uh, that first uh, uh, big picture scale, that lifestyle scale, would have something to say about how self-aware a person is. Uh, Self-regulation, can, again, you can see, please pardon the uh, short forms that I put in there. I started to introduce. The RE scale for responsibility, SO and SC, and so on. We thought that those scales uh, match the idea of self-regulation. Empathy, clearly the empathy scale, insightfulness, tolerance, and sensitivity, and so on it goes. You can easily read the list. But we thought as we went through and read the indications of higher and lower scores on the scale that these were the, the most relevant. OK, so let's go on to the next. Uh, OK, that, it was a two-part question. Does CPI have anything to say about critical thinking? Yes, it does. On the next scale or uh, slide, you can kind of see. Uh, what I did was pull out some of the uh, materials from the participant resource guide for the CPI certification program. We said uh, when it comes to problem solving, decision making, there are those four facets of caution versus impulse, involving others versus standing apart flexibility versus rigidity and creativity and so on. And they are the scales that we uh, indicated in the participant resource binder. 
and um, I will not run through them all. They're just too many. But you can see we think that those scales shine a light on those facets for problem solving and decision making. And finally, if you're interested in pure critical thinking, we think the best thing to do is to use an assessment that is designed for that purpose. Remember, the CPI is a personality assessment. But there is a, an assessment out there called the Watson Glazer Critical Thinking Appraisal from Pearson, not from CTP, that is specific to um, pure critical thinking. And uh, we think sometimes that if you want to be able to describe how someone solves problems and makes decisions, that uh, you uh, take a look at assessments that are designed for that purpose, and that the CPI can enhance your understanding using some of these scales. OK, so let's see. More FAQs. Hi, Rob. It's Laura again. Um, our time is very, very close to ending. And we have received a number of questions. In the interest of time, Rob, I'm going to ask you to personally email and or call the people who submitted questions today, because we are not going to be able to get to them. Sure. But they're really, really excellent questions. So for those of you on the webinar now that did submit a question, within the next week or so, expect to hear from Rob uh, with the answer to your question. Be glad to do it. Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Rob. Before we close, I'd like to do one thing and remind everyone of CPP's Refer Colleague Program for the CPI 260 certification. If you refer someone who does register, we are happily send you a $50 Amazon gift card as a token of our appreciation and gratitude. So um, before I say thank you to Rob and everyone on the line, I want one more reminder that we will email to you the recordings and presentation slides of today and the first webinar back in June. However, if you are unsubscribed here at CPP, you can go to cpp.com backslash email preps, E-M-A-I-L-P-R-E-F-S, to change your preferences to receive our communications, and you'll get the recording and slides. So right now, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us, and especially to you, Rob, for sharing your fabulous knowledge and expertise. Goodbye.